For nearly half a century, there were two Karl Zeisses, one based in the Federal Republic of Germany, or West Germany, the other in the German Democratic Republic, or East Germany. Wait, is Zeisses a word? I'm not sure if it is. Whatever. The Karl Zeiss of today is the West German variant. Their work in lithography and EUV sits on the cutting edge of what is possible in nanoscale technology. But the Karl Zeiss of East Germany was fascinating too. It grew to be a massive industrial conglomerate doing cutting edge research into optics, military tech, and semiconductors. In this video, I want to step away from Asia once more and look at a fascinating history. One of Germany's most iconic companies split in two between East and West. Capitalism and Socialism. Let's go. But first, yes, you know it. I want to talk for a few moments about the Asianometry Patreon. If you like what this channel does, you can support the work by joining the Early Access tier. Early Access members get to see new videos before they are released to the public. There's also a general support tier, and signing up for that would be amazing too. So head on over to the Patreon page and take a look. I deeply appreciate anything you'd be able to sign up for. Thank you, and on with the show. We do not need the whole story on Carl Zeiss, the man, or the company. Here is an abbreviated history on things up until World War II. Carl Zeiss was born in 1816 to a family of artisans. He started a workshop, and that workshop repaired university equipment, made microscopes, and sold scientific instruments like eyeglass lenses and thermometers. In 1866, Zeiss recruited Ernst Abbe, a brilliant 26-year-old physicist from the University of Jena. Abba's insights on the movement of light rays through microscope lenses helped the company to move beyond crude trial and error manufacturing and gave it a leg up on its competitors. After Zeiss's death in 1888, Abba purchased sole ownership of the company from Carl's son. He then transferred his ownership to what is now called the Carl Zeiss Foundation. The foundation has no owners or shareholders. Its purpose was to guarantee the company's existence after Abba's death and that its employees can partake in its economic success. The foundation's guidelines outlined social reforms like health insurance, pensions, profit sharing, equality in hiring decisions, overtime pay, and nine-hour workdays. Excess profits would be invested in the working population of Jena. Critically, Dr. Abba wrote in a provision saying that the company's seat of operations should not be removed from the city of Jena. This provision cannot be modified. But ABBA didn't know about World War II. At the end of World War II in April 1945, the U.S. Army first arrived at and occupied the city of Jena. But the city fell within the Soviet zone of influence, so the United States had to withdraw from the area in July of that year. By then, Zeiss was already an industrial crown jewel. As part of a policy to bring leading German scientists under American control, the Americans quickly spirited away 120 to 130, the exact number is unclear, of the company's top technicians and execs. They would be resettled in the West German city of Oberkochen. The Americans promised the Zeiss workers that their papers and equipment would soon follow, but those got shipped to the United States. Whoops. Once they arrived in Oberkochen, the small group of managers and scientists began starting up production. They formed a new company called Zeiss Opton, with the majority of the stock issued to the Zeiss Foundation. Regarding ABBA's Jena provision, the state government of Baden-Württemberg simply issued a decree to add a second domicile. This essentially allows the Zeiss Opton managers to assume control of all the foundation's assets outside of the Soviet zone. Unprecedented, but then again these were unprecedented times. A few Zeiss employees voted not to abandon the Jena plant. After all, Jena was their home. They may have also believed that they could work with the Soviets, or that the Soviets would never dare try to dismantle the world-famous Zeiss factories. It was not an uncommon attitude at the time, with the Soviet occupation an unknown quantity. Well, the Soviets did it. Twice. On July 9, 1946, the Soviet Council of Ministers ordered the complete dismantling of the Zeiss factories. The equipment, along with 300 former Zeiss employees, would be sent to the city of Krasnogorsk, a center for Soviet military optics research. The Soviet military administration in Germany appealed to Stalin, 
and the Man of Steel ordered the council to leave a small part behind. The council agreed to leave 6% of the factory's capacity. What the Soviets did to Zeiss was not all that unusual. For an amazing chronicle of this time period, I recommend Anne Applebaum's Iron Curtain, The Crushing of Eastern Europe 1944-1956. Really, go read it. Anyway, before the Opton management board left, they appointed some caretakers in Jena to act in the company's interests. For a brief amount of time, the two companies, Opton and Jena, and their boards agreed that the Jena caretaker board would be the sole representative of Carl Zeiss, the former corporate entity and foundation. Both parties agreed to do this so not to agitate the Soviets into expropriating what was left of the company's assets. There also might have been some blackmailing going on behind the scenes by the Soviets, attempting to use the Opton board members' prior involvement in Nazi war crimes to pressure them into accepting full power of attorney from Jena. This facade ultimately failed. Zeiss rebuilt some of its Jena factories, but in 1948 the new German state expropriated all of the foundation's assets without compensation. A new state-owned enterprise called VEB Carl Zeiss Jena took over the assets. VEB meaning Volkseigener Betrieb, or state-owned enterprise. So, here is a philosophical question for you. Carl Zeiss used to be one corporation owned by one foundation. Now you have two companies and two foundations in two parts of the world, both of them claiming to be the one true Carl Zeiss. You now got some sort of weird ship of Theseus situation going on. Both of the companies essentially had to start from zero. Both had critical members of the old company working for them. Both claimed to be the real Carl Zeiss with the backings of their respective governments. Which one do you believe? What happened next can be seen as a microcosm of the Cold War. Starting in the 1950s, the East German regime took control of the old Carl Zeiss Foundation entity and began claiming identity and control of the Zeiss trademarks. Remember, this East German Foundation is by now essentially an empty shell. The corporate assets and employees are now actually part of VEB Carl Zeiss Jena, the state-owned enterprise. The East German Zeiss Foundation exists for the sole purpose of staking claim to the old Zeiss trademarks. The two firms battled it out in court over the next few decades. As you might guess, the Western courts backed Zeiss Opton, the West Germany version, while the Soviet courts backed Zeiss Jena, the East Germany version. The legal intricacies are pretty fascinating to me, and I recommend Zeiss vs. Zeiss by Isaac Shapiro if you want to learn all the nitty-gritty details. But I'm going to skip all that and tell you the ending. After nearly two decades of litigation, the two companies split the world in half and agreed not to use the Zeiss trademark in each other's half of the world. They can still operate there, just not use the Zeiss name. Zeiss of West Germany would use the name Opton in Eastern Bloc countries. Zeiss of East Germany went with something like Ausgena in Western Bloc countries. There is little information out there about VEB Carl Zeiss Jena. While Zeiss Opton carried on in the optics field, VEB Zeiss Jena would eventually grow into a massive technology conglomerate. For a while after its reorganization, Zeiss Jena attempted to build proficiency in the sciences and engineering. There were some successes. They exhibited a special new electron microscope in 1952, and in 1955 built East Germany's first working computer, the Oprima. The Optic Reckon Machine, or Oprima, was for lens systems calculations. It had been in the planning since 1946. It was a relay computer, which means it used electrically operated switches to do calculations. With its 8,313 relays, it had a clock speed of about 100 Hz and could perform square root operations in 1.2 seconds. That being said, the company only made two, and the machine's relay technology had already been superseded by vacuum tube computer technology at the time of its release. In the 1960s, the ruling Socialist Unity Party of Germany, or SED, shifted the company's direction towards pure engineering. But due to import restrictions and supplier difficulties, the company fell behind its Western competitors. Substantial quality control issues emerged as early as 1960, and by 1968, the company was essentially bankrupt. In the 1970s and 80s, 
SED gradually reorganized the East German economy into massive conglomerates, called Kombinate. Zeiss Jena found itself with integrated control over many other smaller VEBs. The new Zeiss conglomerate was instructed to conduct R&D on a variety of new technologies, including robotics, computing, and most importantly, microelectronics. Around this time, SED and the rest of the socialist bloc were growing very concerned about the West's rapid advancement in semiconductor technology. The Zeiss Kombinat's most primary task would be to leverage the company's expertise in optics to build advanced photolithography equipment for the country's indigenous semiconductor industry. The task was given to Zeiss Jena's director Wolfgang Biermann, an uncompromising authoritarian leader with an indomitable will to succeed, he ran Zeiss like a virtual state within a state. And since he had a seat on the SED Central Committee, he had an unusual amount of political leeway. Under his leadership, Zeiss Jena production doubled, despite the labor force staying the same size. 60% of its products were made for export, and it was the only combinant with a sales office in the United States. The company was even the global leader in the planetary optics space. However, he and the company failed to reverse East Germany's declining competitiveness. Despite successfully producing lithography equipment for its sibling conglomerates, the country's semiconductor efforts as a whole during this period fell short of those in the West and Japan. Going into the late 1980s, the Zeiss Jena Kombinat employed nearly 70,000 people in 25 subsidiaries. It was the second largest Kombinat after VEB Robotron, East Germany's largest electronics manufacturer. As the Soviet Union's own native capacity declined, the GDR ordered the conglomerate to expand its military industrial production from 15.7% in 1983 to 28% in 1990. They made some great products at this time, like an optoelectronic homing head for an air-to-air -air missile and a rangefinder for a T-72 tank. However, Soviet demand for military technology vanished in 1986 after Gorbachev's disarmament policies came into effect. Zeiss Jena realized that it needed to switch directions again and prepare for a future opening up of the economy. At the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, Zeiss Jena was working on the production of its 1 megabit memory chip, the U61000. German reunification happened in October 1990 and it was a mess. Officially, East Germany dissolved itself and added its former properties to West Germany. And that is a befitting metaphor to what happened to the two Karl Zeisses. It was a hard time for everyone back then. East German industrial output fell by 51% year over year. Three million East Germans lost their jobs. The Zeiss Kombinat split apart shortly before reunification. 12 of its 25 constituent companies were spun off onto their own. Many of those companies immediately shed thousands of jobs. The remaining 13 companies were renamed Genoptic Karl Zeiss Jena. In 1991, Zeiss Opton, the West German version, acquired Genoptic Karl Zeiss Jena's microscopy and optics divisions. This essentially reunited the pre-war Karl Zeiss firm. However, the new company turned multi-million Deutsche Mark losses as it tried to digest this massive influx of workers amidst new competition from Asia. Despite state support, the company still shed hundreds of jobs over the next few years. The leftover bits of Genoptic Carl Zeiss Jena, renamed to Genoptic as it was no longer associated with the old Carl Zeiss company, was a diversified technology firm employing nearly 7,000 people. It operated in semiconductors, laser optics, and automation. At first, it was in danger of collapsing, but then the government stepped in buying 80% of the assets and saving thousands of high-paying jobs. Guided by Dr. Lothar Speith, former minister-president of Baden-Württemberg, Genoptic prudently grew through acquisition over the next decade. In 1998, they conducted a $400 million IPO. Genoptic is doing well today, valued at over a billion dollars. Zeiss Jena took a really interesting path through history after its split from Opton. The company encountered substantial challenges throughout its 40-plus year history. The Socialist Party structure kept employees from reaping the economic benefits of their own discoveries. Import restrictions from the West prevented Zeiss Jena from getting their hands on Western technologies, 
especially in microelectronics, and forced them to do it all themselves. This was a crucial difference from the countries of East Asia, which were allowed to acquire and absorb technologies from the West. And enforced by the Stasi, an atmosphere of excessive security impeded the company from doing its best work. Workers could not speak about what they were doing, and they were promoted based on their ideologies, rather than their merits. Yet despite this, the company managed to do amazing research, filing as many patents as its West German brother. It became a global leader in certain industries, and was one of the few East German companies to emerge from reunification, largely intact. That whole era of Zeiss Jena's attempted modernization was pretty fascinating to read about. Perhaps I will do a future detailed dive into East Germany's semiconductor space and why that failed. Let me know if that's something interesting to you. All right, everyone, thanks for watching. That's it for tonight. If you want more content, you can like and subscribe to the channel. The feed will show you a bunch more new videos like this one to watch. Remember to hit up the email newsletter and sign up. And if you want to send me an email, drop me a line at john at asianometry.com. I love reading your emails. Introduce yourself, suggest a topic, or more. Until next time, I'll see you guys later.